Hi everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Now I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys as to kind of what's going on with the developing COVID-19 situation as far as I'm concerned, as far as medical students are concerned, med school, how that's all going. So this is just going to be a quick kind of update video as to where I'm at, what my understanding of the situation is, and just trying to address some of the things that you guys have sent in or that you, you want me to kind of opine on. I just need to preface this whole video by saying, obviously, I'm not a medical professional, I'm a medical student, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. I believe what I'm saying to be correct and true, and I'm acting on knowledge that is correct as of Saturday the 14th of March. 2020 obviously this is an ongoing situation things are changing all the time but someone sent in what is COVID-19 so that name refers to the disease that is caused by the virus severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 which is why you're seeing this code name SARS-CoV-2 everywhere it essentially behaves similarly to regular flu with similar symptoms such as dry cough fever shortness of breath muscle aches fatigue runny nose all these standard things but it can then lead to severe pneumonia and multi-organ failure which is what's actually killing people the death rate at the moment we'll talk about this more in a bit seems to be between about one and five percent depending on obviously factors, who's infected, how old they are, what's their immune status and so on and so forth. It's currently diagnosed by real-time PCR, polymerase chain reaction, so you're looking for a genetic sequence that matches to this particular strain of virus. But from my understanding, chest CT is also becoming more useful and I think is a bit more accurate in terms of diagnosing in conjunction obviously with clinical symptoms and history as to whether someone's got COVID-19 or not. At the moment there's no specific antiviral treatment for it or a functional vaccine so essentially at the moment we're just doing what we can to prevent transmission and spread between people to stop it replicating We'll talk about this more in a minute. It's a pandemic as well. Someone asked what a pandemic is. A, a pandemic is like a big or large scale epidemic. So an epidemic is when you get an outbreak of a particular disease in a large population in one area. A pandemic is then when this process takes place over a very large area. So you're talking multiple continents, as is the case with COVID-19. What are we currently doing about it? What's the strategy of the NHS? My understanding of what the NHS's overall strategy is not clear. Um, that is to say, my understanding isn't super good, not that the strategy isn't super clear. Um, essentially, it's going to be emergency management, so making sure that the NHS has plenty of ITU um, and intensive, intensive treatment, intensive care, whatever you like to say, intensive care beds, so that the people who are the most sick have full access to, you know, the specialist trained doctors, the ventilation equipment to deal with the severe pneumonia and the sepsis and the organ failure that can come with it. And there's also this thing we're hearing about called flattening the curve. What this means is that if you imagine that this is the line of the number of people that are infected, so every day we'll have a few, then some will get better and then more get infected and so on. If you have a big point outbreak, you get a huge spike like this in the number of people that are infected. If we have a sudden outbreak, so if a load of people are exposed to a coronavirus patient, this number will do this and you get a big spike in the curve and temporarily that huge population that need treating will overwhelm health services right because there's only so many doctors per head of the population anyway in the UK we're actually less good at that than most other countries in Europe as in we have fewer doctors per head of the populace let alone intensive care specialists so the idea is that by creating gaps in infection and bringing down the incidence of these huge spikes, we can actually flatten the curve because we still expect many people to become infected. But if it at least happens over a longer period of time, at any one given point, there's only a certain number of people that need treating by intensive care specialists. So by flattening the curve, we can lower overall demand on health services. Even if the same number of patients are to be treated, we can actually manage that because we're never overwhelmed. How do we go about flattening the curve? At the moment, it's just looking like self-isolation if you become symptomatic and generally good hygiene. And I'll, I'll leave the, um, the most current NHS guidelines in the description below if you want to have a read of them. They're probably a good thing to be aware of right now. At the moment, I'm asymptomatic as far as I know, I'm fine. So just practicing things like good hygiene, washing your hands with soap and water. They're talking about singing happy birthday whatever you like, just making sure that you're carrying out really good hygiene, 
sneezing into your elbow rather than into the air because the virus transmits through droplets that are expelled into the air like most respiratory illnesses. You can also use hand gel with at least 60% isopropyl alcohol, I believe the guidelines are saying, but that's when soap and water are not available. Soap and water is still, as far as I know, considered to be the best way of getting rid of the bug. And you may wish to practice things like social distancing, so staying away from other people, staying at home unless you specifically need to go somewhere. If you do go somewhere, staying, you know, a meter or two away from other people. Because you need to be within a certain proximity, obviously, of those droplets that are in the air to catch the virus. If you stay away from people, it's going to make it much less likely that you come into contact with those droplets. Or indeed picking them up off contaminated surfaces, which is another way that the virus can spread. Someone's asked, how severe is it? Is it just flu? I'm one of those people who was actually guilty at the beginning of this, of going, it's just flu, calm down, you know, the mass hysteria isn't worth it. That's not fair comment. It's not just flu. It's definitely worse than normal flu. The death rate from typical influenza is about 0.1%, you know, as of our current understanding. For this, this may be as high as 4 or 5%, depending on the study that you look at, where it was done, over what period it was done. The data isn't super clear, but is it more dangerous than normal flu? Yes, particularly for those who are immunocompromised, elderly, those at risk and can't fight off the infection. But the risk of death in those under 50 is still drastically, drastically lower than those over the age of 70. I think that much is clear at the moment. Someone's asked, what do I think of public behaviour? <laughs> it's difficult for me to, to comment, obviously. Are people being a bit stupid? Yes, particularly with the panic buying of, you know, buying out stocks of food, buying all the toilet paper, preparing to be quarantined at home for months on end. Like, just practice good hygiene, be sensible with what you're doing. I think even though it is dangerous for some people, we as a whole are overreacting. And a lot of that is led by the media, right? People don't know what to believe. People are sharing just nonsense bullshit things on Facebook that are mis- attributed to medical professionals or that don't make any sense. The thing that does concern me about the way that people are behaving is things like stealing hand gel and masks from hospitals, which we know is going on. Hospitals are struggling to keep these things in stock. Obviously, if hospital staff are dealing with immunocompromised patients particularly because of this weird I hesitate to call it selfish, but it probably is selfish. Don't steal stuff from hospitals because they're treating the people who definitely need treating. I think the best thing for people to do is just try and remain calm, follow new guidelines as they're published by the appropriate health bodies. I don't think that's particularly controversial, but people are definitely panicking. And then the other major thing that I wanted to talk about is how is this how is this affecting medical schools? That's what people were mostly asking me about. At the moment at Warwick, um, we're still business as usual. We're still, as far as I know, being told to attend placement, regardless of whether your hospital has confirmed cases or not. We've not had any guidance to say otherwise. Some medical schools have closed or pulled people off placement, so they're not potentially acting as vectors for disease. I'm personally not 100% sure what, what I feel about that. I do not have enough evidence of my own or understanding of the situation enough to suggest what would be best. Different countries are trying different things um, to varying effect. It is clear that the ones who are, who are doing the most kind of fervent lockdown seem to be making the most progress with the disease. Whether the UK will go that way, I really don't know. Is there an argument for pulling med students off placement? Yeah, absolutely, because we're completely supernumerary. We don't have a, a functional role um, within the NHS. Obviously, we're not paid staff. We don't have to be there. So do we introduce an element of risk by being there? Yes, we absolutely do. But as far as the medical school is concerned, kind of education continues. Obviously, we do still need to study and continue training towards being doctors. So at the moment, I'm happy to kind of wait for further instructions from NHS England, from the university. I do trust their judgment, um, ultimately, to decide whether or not we're going in. So at Warwick, we're still going in. Everything is pretty much as normal for the moment, as of today. Apart from the fact that the electives have been cancelled now for the final year students. So they've just done their final exams. They are due in the next couple of weeks to be going on their electives. This is this optional 
um, six week period where you can go abroad or go somewhere, see something in medicine that you want to see. It is kind of a really big part of the medical school experience. Unfortunately, because of the developing situation, these have been cancelled. I know that's been really disruptive for some people because that's not based on kind of World Health Organization guidelines. That's something that the medical school have chosen to do. So I understand that getting um, insurance claims and getting your money back for things is made more difficult by the fact that they've done that. A lot of conferences and things are being cancelled as well. There's a lot of uncertainty about um, how doctors in training are going to continue to progress because the surgical exams, um, the MRCS exams, for example, have been cancelled as far as I'm aware. So people who want to study surgery can't get that exam done at the moment. And there's talk that a lot of surgical doctors and non-ITU doctors generally might have to start doing more medical cover just due to short staffing. And then the other question is about whether or not med students are going to be roped in to potentially help out on the front lines, which I imagine will just be things like clerking patients doing bloods and obs, like the normal things that an F1 would do just in your capacity as a medical student, um, as a soon-to-be considered final year medical student myself. I don't think that's an insensible thing to do. You know, you've got warm bodies, if they're asymptomatic, we might as well be doing the things that we've been trained to do, obviously in a legally and medically safe manner. As far as I understand, that will be voluntary according to the guidelines that I've led, so they can't force you to do that. You can volunteer to help out, which if, you know, if that happens, that's something that I myself will be doing. Obviously, as long as I'm not compromised. And I believe that the NMC has also issued um, similar guidelines for final year student nurses, although I believe it's slightly different because they get their nursing pins much sooner than we would qualify as, as medics relatively within the course. So that may work slightly differently. If you're a nurse or a nursing student, please let me know. I'd, I'd really love to know more about that. I think the other major concern that a lot of us medical students have is that, and this is a very, um, not selfish, selfish isn't the word once again, but it's basically to qualify as a doctor to graduate properly, you need to experience a certain number of clinical hours and you know get appropriate clinical exposure as part of your course. If, as med students, we are pulled out of placement for very good reason, I'm not disputing that, um, will we fall foul of the GMC's rules, you know, and not have adequate clinical exposure as students and not be able to graduate or have delayed graduation um, or not be able to sit exams because you can't gather everyone together, so on and so forth. Um, my cohort are very much approaching our final year of medical school, so will it interfere with our graduation, particularly if this all keeps going on as I expect it to, I guess, because we're not expecting to have a vaccine until at least 2021. What's going to happen there? Will there have to be alternate provisions made? Potentially. Really don't know what's going to happen. So it, it's not active worry because obviously everyone is in the same situation. It's just a little bit of uncertainty. Who knows what's going to happen? it be interesting as well. I'm just coming to the end of my psychiatry rotation as well. Obviously, we're not dealing with, I hesitate to use the term, medically unwell psychiatric conditions, medical conditions as much as everything else, but they're not usually infectious. Um, I'm doing my acute medicine rotation, so a lot of A&E exposure in the next few weeks that's starting so will that change things will that experience be different i honestly don't know so that's kind of where we're at guys at the moment i don't really have anything else to cover right now i hope that's answered everything that you wanted answering i'd really really like to know your thoughts on what's going on whether med students should be pulled out of clinical practice should lectures all go online um what are your feelings you know worries concerns ideas concerns and expectations about what's going on Equally, if you're a med student or a nursing student or any healthcare, even any student at university, um, we all share common ground there. I'd really love to know what you think about what's going on. And lastly, my condolences to everyone who was due to sit the GAMSAT. Um, I know that's been cancelled and that might delay your hopes of going into medical school this year. I think it was sensible to cancel it. Like, ultimately, I do agree with that decision, but I appreciate that you know, the application to med school is awful and, and delaying that even further. If you've had a disappointing result this year, for example, with applications will be concerning. I, I do feel for you, as well as those with obviously vulnerable friends and family. Um, I'm a bit worried about my own grandparents who are still alive because all it kind of takes is a careless mistake for some serious harm um, to occur. So that, that generally goes out as well. 
Okay guys, hopefully we'll hear from you in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. Take care. Good luck.